Okay, so we're going to be in the book of Psalms, chapter uh, 18. And tonight we'll go through a few of the, we're trying to get through, we might we can get through three Psalms tonight. You know, you figured it up because we got 150, got a long way to go. So we're trying to do the best we can. But again, I reminded the, the early on, these are the songs of David. Uh, a little bit of overview. Remember, chapter was it chapter 14 and chapter 40 are the same song? You remember that? One of the Psalms is exactly the same. It's a repetition. Uh, everyone copied them down. Remember, it's a conglomeration. Remember, all these were put together. Because you get the chapter, what is it, uh, Psalm 70 something that it says, David, the last Psalm of David, but yet he's got 101 and then 108. There's more after that. So we know that uh, this is a, 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 a psalm book, and it's a collection of psalm books that have been put together, right? So Psalms chapter 18. We'll begin tonight in verse number one. By the way, I remind you, they're singing this now. They are singing this. And one thing I love about this, do you know what happens here? There's no new song coming out. There's no new song coming out. They've got the same song book. You read up songs, but there's not a lot of songs in the Bible. There are some... But did you know every one of them had a meaning to it? They all had meanings. So David is pouring his heart. We're reading this, but it's a song. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, and whom I will trust. My buckler, I mean shield, and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Now it says, if you'll read above this here, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, servant of the Lord. Speaking to the Lord the words of this song in the day the Lord delivered him in the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, remember, David had a lot of difficulties in his life. You know, I preached a sermon Sunday concerning his family, his friends and his foes. He was a man that had trouble. His family was against him when he fought Goliath. Remember, the oldest son spoke out against him. The friend said, you can't do it. Saul said, you can't do it. And by the way, if you're going to fight him, you better fight him my way. And he said, I can't do it. And the enemies are against him. So he was delivered on so many occasions. But we all remember Saul. Saul and Goliath are the two that stands out in your mind. When it comes to David being delivered, it is the hand of Saul and the hand of Goliath. You know, his own people and the enemy. When God delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Remember, Saul was out to kill him. And Saul would apologize, but you know what Saul was sorry about? That he got caught. It's a different, listen to this. He was sorry about his sin, but not about the person he sinned against. I'm sorry that I did that. I did something wrong. But you weren't sorry about the man that you hurt. You didn't think about him. And many times that's the way it is. They're sorry, but I should never have done so. I feel bad that I did that. And they never think about the person they did it against. They never do. He says, no, the Lord is my rock, fortress. Of course, you know what a rock and a fortress is, a deliverer. A rock and a fortress are those things that protect you. A deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. By the way, all of his trust was in the Lord. When David went out to fight the Goliath, fight Goliath if you may, maybe you didn't remember this, but Sunday, I made mention of it. When he fought Goliath, if you saw Goliath, the giant, then you're prideful and it's sinful. David went out to fight Goliath. He didn't see a giant because when you see the giant, you become afraid. It's because you're looking at him and you're comparing him to yourself. When you see the giant, you're looking at him. I know what you're doing is you're comparing him to yourself. When David went out to fight, he wasn't comparing himself to any at all. He wasn't even in the equation. He was simply looking at him like he did that bear in that line. I'm going to kill you. And he said something to him. David said, I'm going to kill you and feed you the fowls of the air. He wasn't looking at a giant. He was looking at an enemy of God. This is the, the way he approached about everything he did. A man after God's own heart, as I said the other day, he's not a man that's going after God's heart, trying to find it. He's not running after it. No. After, he's, in other words, he's like my son. He's just like me. 
He's, he's just after his dad, just like his dad. He's after his dad. After the heart of God means he was like God. He thought like God. So he understands my God. He's my deliverer, my fortress, my strength, and whom I will trust. My deliverance is not going to come because of me. My deliverance comes because of God. And if you ever believe anything happens in your life by happenstance, it does not. What happened to David out there with those sheep set the stage for his whole life. In the quiet time of his life is when he learned to trust in the Lord. As he told Saul, hey, listen, I slew a lion and I slew a bear. God done that. I didn't do it. I can slay him. Why? Because if I can do that, God did it for me. And if God done that, then he know he'll do this. Especially what I heard him say against God's army. No, he's my buckler, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. All the things that protect you, and all the things that give you deliverance. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. By the way, if you think you've got strength without God, you're wrong. You're not mighty. You're not Jason Statham. You're not Rocky in the ring, or Mike Tyson. By the way, have you ever seen that boxers when they get old? Yeah, they get feeble, don't they? One of the most outstanding things to look in my life, because I grew up in an era when we cropped tobacco. And you know what we did? We had, we had cigarettes. Now, Daddy was a Salem man. Mama was a Winston man. Winston woman, rather. But there was a guy that came in and they called him the Marlboro Man. Remember him, the Marlboro Man? All you got to do is just look him up at the end of their lives. What did he look like? They are scrawny, with oxygen on, with a... <laughs> Nobody lasts forever. Does God's strength ever get weak? No. Your strength gets weak. God does not. Never. So if you've got God's strength, what happens? You never have to worry about it. The book of Deuteronomy ends with something concerning the man by the name of Moses. It said Moses, there was never a prophet like him. What else did it say about his strength? His eyes were not dim. One other thing, the King James says it like this, neither was his natural force abated. He was as strong at the end of his life as he was anywhere else. Tell you what, if you don't believe it, I, I, turn there. I said that. I, Brother Andre remembered it. Just go to Deuteronomy. If you don't know where that is, go to Joshua chapter one and back up one. I heard a guy trying to tell some people how to get to first Chronicles. He said, just go to second Chronicles. It'd be right before it. <laughs> I thought that was a good one for the preacher. In Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 7, the Bible says this, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. He was just as strong as ever because his strength came from God. And if you, don't, and if you think he was the last of these, think about God's men. There were two men that went to the promised land that came out of Egypt, Joshua and Caleb. And if you ever read about Caleb, Caleb was 80 years old. And they told him, well, Caleb, you know, you and no, don't you do it. Give me that mountain. I'll take it. He said, I'm as strong as I ever was. And he was. He could wield a sword and fight like he always did. His strength come from the Lord. This is what David is. David says God is his strength. When he goes out to fight Goliath, he doesn't see a giant. He sees an enemy of God. He doesn't see any enemy in relationship to himself. When he goes to fight any battle, he doesn't see the enemy in relationship to himself. He sees the enemy in relationship to God. If you're against God, well, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm an instrument of the Lord. No, you're not. Yeah, I am. I'm going to tell you what the Lord said. I'm sorry I'm going to have to do this to you, but this is what the Lord wants me to do. God was like that. And David understands it. He now goes to verse 4. The sorrows of death can pass me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid the sorrows of hell compassed me about the snares of death prevented me in my distress i called upon the lord in the midst of all the trouble all the difficulties of his life even the sorrows of death of the grave of sheol compassed me death in my distress, I called upon the Lord, and I cried unto God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even unto his ears. 
God is always listening out. David knew that. If I ever call upon him, he always listens. But what a time we have now. You know, in those days, God, it was sundry times, and his divers manner spoke by the prophets, my son, and he indwells us. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I have not seen nor heard, Isaiah 64, verse 4, that God himself indwells us. And in those times, the Holy Spirit would come upon a man, and then he would leave, and he would give the prophet something to say, and you go to ask him, you can go to God anytime you want and get on your knees and ask him. And he answers your prayer. David said, I'm going to trust in the Lord. Even though the pangs of it, I cried and he heard me. In my distress, when you're, dis you're having a difficult time, what do you do? You call upon the Lord and he hears you. And then the earth shook. What happened? Why? Because I cried to the Lord. I love it when you, when you hear uh, God giving those laws out. I remember in Exodus when he told him, he said, now y'all better do this here. And you take care of the women and the children and the poor man. Y'all don't do them wrong because if they start crying unto me, I'm going to come get you. I better not hear no cries from them. It was like that. He said, if the poor people start crying out to me because of oppression, I'll hear it. and It won't be a good thing. God is like that. He's always open. He's always ready to, to help. And David understands this. He said, I cried to God. He heard my voice. My cry came unto him, even in his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. Why? But, yeah, I'm that, I'm that good. No, it's not because you're that good. It's because God loves you that much. God comes to your rescue. When you need him, God comes to your rescue. And confidence, confidence. Oh, can you hear Moses when he said to those people, when the enemy stood against him, and he just called on the Lord, and he said, look, Korah, you're wrong. You're the one that troubles this people. I'm not the one that takes too much upon myself. You are. And he looked at all the people and said, get away from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And he said, if, something, if they die a natural death, I ain't a man of God. That's confidence, ain't it? That's a man that just understands. That's the kind of man David, he knows when he calls on God, God's on his side. Moses is like that. David is like this. The earth shook. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Why is he wroth? This person is in trouble. Jesus said it were better than a millstone be hanged about your neck, be cast in a depth of the sea than to offend the least in his kingdom. He loves his children. So Brother Harris, how can he love them? You said he was going to deliver them. And they died at the hands of their enemies. Oh, you haven't seen anything. Sting of death is gone. Let me walk you through an eye of faith and let's go over here to the end of the book right quick. See the terror in their eyes when a man has to die and end up in hell and find out that he's there and there's no help. When he finds out God's against him and God puts terror in him like there's no tomorrow, every judgment comes out. God is a God of judgment. Every little thing happens. And if you do somebody wrong, you're just gonna, it's going to get come back to you always. No other religion has this here. No other religion has this. Only God has it. There's always justice. He says in hell, everybody gets what's coming to them. Revelation chapter 20. Open the books, the judge out of those books. Just like in heaven. Some have gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hand, stubble. For it will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may receive of the things done in his body according to that which he has done. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. God is a God of justice. And if they do wrong, God says, my wrath will rack's hot. Well, he killed his whole family and he died. He killed himself. He got out of it. No, he didn't. As it is appointed unto the men wants to die, but after this, judgment. No, wrath, wrath, wrath. He went up a smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of it, and fire out of his mouth, devoured. Coals were kindled. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. Wow. You know, he kind of reminded, was it Haggai or Habakkuk? The one of them that was, remember he said, wait, Lord, I didn't mean it like that. Who was that? Ah, it's one of them. When he said, God, how long are you going to let these people get away with this? These evil men, they do such and such. And then God comes in and starts destroying them. He says, wait, whoa, God, it didn't mean that much. You can wipe everybody out. You told me to come get them, and I'm going to come get them too. I'll take care of you. God is going to take care of these. Look at that verse 9. He says, he bowed to the, he to the heaven, the darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness 
his secret place. Wow. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him and were dark waters and thick clouds of skies. In other words, he's not coming in the fluffy skies and the, in the, you know, it was the, what was the little horse with the unicorn that the little girls had? What was that one? That was the unicorn. No, was it, uh, it was a famous horse they had back oh, then. The horse, like my, little pony. my Little Pony. My Little Pony. Remember My Little Pony? All yeah. oh, the sweet stuff. You remember that one there? This is not God. He's got the clouds, the dark clouds. In other words, it's the fear that he's bringing. It's the sixth seal being opened in Revelation chapter 6. When you find the sixth seal and, the, and all the great men of the earth say, they cry, hide us, rocks, mountains, hide us, fall on us and hide us from the him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's what God does. He brings fear to them. God breaks you. As he, I watched him break a, a man I thought would, I mean, I, I, I mean, it was, it was a guy, a man just easy to hate, you know, just easy to hate him. Young boy, mean and trouble all the time. And he cussed like a sailor, mean as a snake. And then he got him in that little room and was talking about different things, sharing their problems. And he had to they made him sit there because it's jail. And I remember something struck him. He told a story and I won't tell it here, but that boy went to crying. And I was feeling sorry for myself. God. And I remember how God broke the boy. You know, God has a way of getting you work. He will come and break you. That's what he's saying here. No, he made darkness his secret. His pavilion round about were dark waters, thick clouds. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. And finally, he says this. Then the channels of waters were seen. The foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. And the Lord at the blast of the breath of his nostril. Brother Cam, if you got the re NIV, read verse 15 from the NIV, would you? The battle of the sea was closed, and the fountains of the earth went In other words, nothing secret. The foundations of all things were exposed. Everything. Nothing is hid. We look at the, the, the vastness of the universe and think of how small we are. And I would tell you, that doesn't even scratch the surface when it comes to God. We can't even, you know, what man is confined by is space, the time continuum, you know, the volume. E equals MC squared. Mass gets lighter and lighter until you get to the speed of light. And we talk about those things. We can't even understand life without those kinds of things because it doesn't exist. With God, it does not. We can't even understand that. That's why we can't understand him. But he's given us stuff that we might understand when he says, open the waters, the foundations of the world were discovered. Why? At thy rebuke. When God rebuked, everything listened. Stop. And he speaks, everything stops. Everything listens. And nothing is hid from him. In other words, you can't hide from him. Even the dark, the deep places, the channels of the earth, the foundations of the world were discovered at his rebuke at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. Now, if he has that, David can say, I'm in safety. That's what the song is about. He begins talking about how he's going to trust in the Lord. And then he talks about how he was in distress and he called on God. And when God shows up, that's what he's I just read. God comes and he just delivers me. Well, can you imagine the people singing this here? Oh, and it just encourages you in this song. By the way, that's why we all, we all need to sing. Lift up your voice. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you, the, all you land. Well, the Bible says here, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. Now, you know, we, we know that's the imagery there because God doesn't have vocal cords and nostrils and things, right? God is a spirit, right? And they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. But you understand what, he's mean, what he means here. At the breath of his nostrils. In other words, at the, he ain't even touched anybody. He was just breathing like a man. 
bring it out through his nostrils, boom, and it just opened everything. That's how little it takes, the power he has. He sent from above, he took me and drew me out of many waters. In other words, he delivered me. I was in trouble, and he reached down to deliver me. How did he do it? In the middle of all this, there's a miracle that happens. You know what the miracle is? Somebody said, well, I saw that miracle, you know. The lion, the mouths were shut, and Daniel was delivered. I saw the miracle. The fire didn't touch them, and they weren't scorched. I saw the miracle. I saw the miracle. My feet, Peter said, I walked on the water. I saw it. The real miracle is this, that God does it for you. See, David got that part. He wasn't overwhelmed with all the miracles. He was overwhelmed with this. Who is man that thou art mindful of him? He understood after God's heart, and I know where I stand in relation to God, and yet he still loves me. So I'm not worthy of his love, but you can sure bask in it, can't you? You may not be worthy of it, but he still loves you. I mean, you will ask yourself over and over, I'm just not worthy, I'm not worthy, and yet he still loves you, don't you? This is why God gave us children. The same hand tear you up, or set you on, well, we were talking the other day about how we had the found, we have uh, boundaries, boundaries, how kids had boundaries. My buddies were talking about it at Washington Park where I went to school at. Uh, my buddy stayed with what they call the projects now, but they were housing them. It was a, it was, but their them mamas kept them houses up. He said, brother, if you wasn't on the porch, that porch light, the outside light come on, and you wasn't there, mama said, go get me a switch. You know, you had boundaries. You knew you better be at this place. You had to be here. We were structured, and it gave so much to us. I said, yeah, we understand that. It's the same hand that corrected you. Always, They always loved you. You never doubted that mama loved you. And you knew if you were ever in trouble, you could run and grab that frock of hers and hold on and she'd just nurture you and take care of you. Daddy beat anybody in the world over you. Take care of you. You have to have those of you who know what that is. A frock was a, it's what women called a dress back then. Yeah. Some people I've done. Well, that's, I was, the people that raised me were born in 1911, so I've got those old uh, terms, scour the floor and heist the window, come and get your rations. <laughs> What's that? That's food. Food. Uh, but the point is, David is making is this. Even though he knows he's not worthy of any of this, he can call on God. Just as a child knows, even though dad may spank me and may correct me, may discipline me, I have, you never doubt dad loves me. My dad will take care of me. My dad will always be there. A real father, that's the way he is. And that's the way God is. He loves you. He would chasten Israel. He would just put her right where she needed to be. Like a son, he would always, but nobody else would ever touch Israel. I want you to kill all the Midianites. Kill every one of them. All the Amalekites, Saul wants to kill every one of them because of what they did to my children. That's the way God was. He loved, and David's basking in this. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me. But they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into the large place. He delivered me and because he delighted in me. If you want to underline in your Bible, underline that part there. He delighted in me. Why? Ask yourself the question. Why does God delight in man? What did the good mother man do? He failed. Man's been a sinner since the day he was born. David is the very person who says, in my mother's womb, I was shapen in iniquity. I know that I, in my, there's nothing there good, but God still loves you. Can you ever imagine why? Look how he says it. Look how he puts it there. Because he delighted in me. What have I ever done that would ever cause him to love me? You think about it. Well, you know, I've done such and such. You know, I, I think I can be a good asset to the church. Sir, you can't add nothing to the church. You're no good. You won't be a bit of help to the church. You know, you just had to get saved. Well, I've got a lot of things, you know, I could really help the church out. You can't help a thing. You can't do anything for the church. God don't need you. God never has needed any of us. But yet when he delights in you, thank God for it. Thank God for it. Even though that you, were, you hated him, you despised him, he loved you so much he died for you. David understands that he got that because he delighted in me. Why did he do this? He brought me to a large place, snatched me out of those waters, delivered me because he delighted in me. 
I'm reminded of some of those old preachers that someone that would say that's the very thing they always ask. Why in the world would the Lord delight in me? Well, David has served the Lord. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. He according to the cleanness of my hands. He hath recompensed me. By the way, let me ask you this. In David's time, that's a difficult principle on the other side of the cross. On this side of the cross, it's still somewhat difficult. So I'm going to take this side of the cross first and explain this. Let me just read a couple of verses. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He hath recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from, the, from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away a statute from me. I was upright before him and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. So let me take that from this side, from the, the side now of the cross. How in the world can you say that you've got right... My, God's rewarding me because of my righteousness. And you say, well, you ain't got nothing, Brother Glenn. But yet we find that they cast their crowns before him. We find that the Lord is going to give you treasures in heaven. Lay not up treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. We're going to receive the, the things done in his body. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, 12, and 13. Some with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hand, stubble, right? So you are going to get a reward in heaven. Everybody does. You've done something right, by the way. So what about the penalty for when you don't do what's right for the saint of God? What penalty is there? None. Think about it. I'm on this side of the cross here. For the saint of God, it's all about the reward. Romans chapter 8, at the end of that whole chapter 1, so you get to chapter 8, the pendulum swings. You're so lost you can never be saved. And then when he works his way all to chapter 8, you can't be lost. For there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. God is only concerned about you do right. He'll chasten you. He'll get you back right. But the death has been, the debt has been paid in the death of Christ. The penalty has been paid. There is therefore no condemnation. There's no penalty to your sin. Well, that's eternal security. You can do whatever you want to do. Why would I do that? Because you, you said your sins are paid for. That's a natural thing to do. That's right. That's what a natural man does. But the saint of God does not want to do that. That's what David is speaking about here. You want to do what's right. David was after God's heart. He, wanted, he was like God. He wanted to think like God. And if you don't ever think about it with David, if you ever want to look inside the mind of David, you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And in that place, you find where nobody else in the Bible ever says this. Only David is accredited with this. And I believe this is the place when God said it, because God said, you'll never build me a house, but I'll build you a house. I'll build you the dynasty. That's where that Davidic kingdom, the millennial kingdom came from. From 2 Samuel chapter 7. When David said, I sit here in a house of paneling and the Lord's out there in the tent. That just ain't right. Nathan, I want to build the Lord a house. And God says, tell him he can't build me a house. He shed blood. But he said, David, in all my years in the wilderness, in all the days that I have been in that tent, nobody's ever thought about building me a house. You're the only one. You see, he was thinking about God. He was after God's heart. He thought like God thought. It's, what, what, what can I do for my Lord? That's the righteousness that he's referring to. David, regardless of what he ever did, God was right. When David did wrong, Lord, I've sinned. Lord, I'm the man. He always agreed with God. Why was his hands clean? Because the true sin is when you are in rebellion to God. When you sin, I, I was wrong, Lord, you're right. That's what God wants to hear every day. That's what every saint of God wants to hear from somebody that's done wrong. Hey, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Because God always forgets. That's who God is. David understood that. His righteousness came from God. God gave him his righteousness. He says, I know my, where my heart is. Lord, 
My righteousness is why you deliver me because I want what you want. You're right, I'm wrong. And he says it in the midst there. I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. I didn't leave the Lord. I didn't leave him. Now, there are two times in David's life, he said, well, they call it the lapse of David when he was down at Ziklag. And on the other occasion, when uh, they lost, the, they stole his family, they came and took, while they were out there fighting. I want you to know something. David was a man that loved God. His righteousness is why God loved him. And it was what God gave to him. And David didn't let it slide. Even when he sinned, he said, God, you're right. Did David ever get mad with God because Absalom died? No. He mourned over him, but he never blamed God. Did David blame God when his, when his little boy died? Did he have with Bathsheba? No. God was right. I can't bring him back. I can go where he's at. God was always right. Because if you look at the two boys, the one son he, he, he mourned over, Absalom, he died a sinner. The other child, so he mourned after Absalom died. With the other child, he mourned before the child died because there was a difference in their destinations. But he always said God was right. And that verse there in verse number uh, where I, I've not put away, excuse me, 24. Yes, uh, no, 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 not 24. Um, 21. I've not departed from my God. Let me mark that there because I don't want to miss that. Yeah, I not wickedly departed from my God because that's that's the ultimate. If a person can leave God and get saved and go back in the world and get saved again, they weren't saved to start with. How do you know? Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new. You're either saved or you're lost. They like to talk about a carnal Christian. Brothers and sisters, you're either saved or you're lost. God, that's a man-made term. A it is a contradiction. That's what people, they try to do that to try to explain the word of God. When we get there, we'll be able to understand it. It's not, it's not hard. Brothers and sisters, God sees us for the right that we do. We fail God. God knows our hearts. If we agree with him, we're righteous in his sight. Now, on the other side of glory, that's where David was. And that his righteousness is because... I want whatever God wants. And he did. Comments. I know that's a, that's a tough passage of scripture there. It took me a long time of meditation. Comments. All right. Let's move on to verse number 25. We'll go, go from there. 25. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. God will take care of the if people that do right. If you're right where you need to be, he'll take care of you. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. With the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. And wilt thou, for thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. And we know that's a principle of how God deals with man, and he always has, except that one we had an exception, didn't we? His name was Job. <laughs> God always does this. But just because a person's in trouble doesn't mean that God is against them. The bad man, he does do them wrong. Well, this should nothing happen to the good. No, it doesn't mean nothing bad happens to the good man. It's just that God's the one who does this here for a reason. If he's doing it here, he's just chasing in those he loves. People can't, can't understand when things happen. They want to kind of pigeonhole people and put them in a right where they got them and how God's dealing with them. But the Lord will bring down people that are wrong. Now, verse number 28, for thou wilt light my candle. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. God will take care of me. He'll lighten my way. He will always watch over me. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. Why? For by thee, I have run through a troop. And by my God, I have leaped over a wall. David said, I ran through a troop, leaped over a wall. I can, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. By the way, have you ever noticed how people name it and claim it about what they're going to do for God? They set something in their heart, make a purpose in their heart, and they're going to do something. David leaped over a wall and ran through a troop. Why? Well, because I felt like that was the right thing to do. No, because God told him to do it. 
You have not because you ask not, because you ask amiss, it may consume it upon your lusts. You don't want to do great things because you're trying to lift up yourself. You're doing it for God. As John the Baptist, I must decrease, he might increase. But David could do great things, but it's because God wanted him to do it. Have you ever noticed? Well, I could do that. By the way, did you know God could have used anybody? He didn't need Moses, did he? He just chose a man in an unusual circumstance. He could have chose anybody. And by the way, Moses had an unusual circumstance how God got him there, right? But how many others had, I'm just a regular guy. I'm not a prophet's son, neither was I you know, son of a prophet. I'm just a gatherer of the sycamore fruit. You know, I'm, Amos was just a regular guy. Who am I to? I can't do so and so. And yet God would use them, wouldn't he? Regular men. Who was Peter, by the way? Was he an educated man? No. Most of those guys were nothing. In fact, they looked at him and said that they were unlearned and ignorant. But to knowledge of them, they've been with Jesus. They were unlearned and ignorant. Sometimes God chooses unusual men. Sometimes they choose a regular man from it. Who is this? And that's who Jesus was, remember? He was just a regular man. No beauty, no nothing about him. And they said, ain't that Joseph's son? He was, no, he was a nobody. We often think they're great. No, he was great because God made him great. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler, a shield to all those who trust in him. God will give his strength to you. And for who is God? Save the Lord. Who is a rock? Save our God. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet. Anybody know what hind's feet are? Deer. deer. How is a deer? They can run, leap, jump. Deers are amazing animals. You know that? You know, suicide. I said one of them running my truck. That big uh, Ed, Suburban. I'm traveling 55 miles an hour. Come out of the middle of, out of a person's yard. And I'm, I mean... By the way, it wasn't the woods now. That's my wife. This is a residential section. And it all of a sudden, when I just went straight into it, I turned, I went, pull, turn around. He's laying out there. And the, when I shined the lights on him, he got up, hobbled, and God, how in the world could he come from that? But they can run and jump and leap. He said, That's the way God makes me. He said to me upon the high places, He teacheth me, He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. Wow. He can, in other words, what he's talking about, you know, the bows, you, you remember when you was a boy and you make your bow and arrow? And when you ever went to one of them shops where they had the real bow and arrow, you pick it up. It was so hard. David said he was that strong. He was that. By the way, remember, David was a mighty man of war, right? He was only about so tall, right? Fair looking, good looking, just a, he just didn't look like the part, but he could wield a sword. Why? Because it wasn't him doing it. It never was. Never was. David is the Samson of my life. I love that because Samson was, was a small man that could beat everybody. However, a steel is broken by my arms. Thou hast also given me a, the shield of thy salvation. And thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps unto me, that my feet do not slip. These are the provisions of God. Long song about God's provision and care for him. Why is it a long song? Because I believe he was in a lot of trouble. David understood. He has escaped, by the way. Remember how many times was it? Twice he had the spirit thrown at him, right? Then he was out in the field and and he, and he couldn't go home anymore. Twice he, well, the first time was in the cave when he got Saul. And the second time he was a, he was in the middle of the camp. And had, he went and got the, the water, the helmet right beside him where he was asleep. He told Abner, said, hey, see, you ain't protecting your. He was that kind of a man, but he would never hurt him. He would never hurt Saul, but he knew Saul was after him. He knew Saul was going to kill him. And he'd give this long song for this. Verse number 37, we'll try to finish this up. He says, I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. 
this is the strength he gives us, is not just deliverance, but the off offense. Remember, Paul the Apostle talked about all the things of the, uh, the armor of God. There's only one thing that's offensive and that everything else is defensive, right? Helmet of salvation. Gird is a breastplate of righteousness. Gird about with the truth. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, of uh, peace. Shield of faith. Those are all defensive. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is the only offensive weapon. But that's what he means here. Not only am I being delivered, but it's offensive as well. I pursued, I overtook. Verse 38, I have wounded them, and they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. How did they fall against you? You stood up, you told them the truth. They didn't like it. What happened? They ran upon him. They gnashed upon him with their teeth, and they said this. Kill him. He's not worthy to live. And he said, Father, forgive them. And at that moment, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus stood up, and Stephen died. Yeah. The man of God, thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, and I might destroy them that hate me. And David did. David did destroy them. They cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord. But he answered them not. Nobody will help you. When God's man stood firm upon his word, and he stood and nobody could help the enemy, they cried, but there was none to save them. The Lord would not answer them. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as dirt in the streets. God hates sin. God delivers. And by the way, he used David. Now, in that time, we know that God did do that. We studied this the other night. When God avenged Israel of the Midianites, and the Midianites brought back the women, and they killed all the men. And Moses said, why did you do this? The men weren't the problem. It was the women that was the problem. And so they got there and kill all the little boys. But they'll grow up one day. And any woman who's ever known a man, kill every one of them. And the rest of them can save a lot. The Amalekites, kill all of them. He saved Agag. Samuel slew him. Why, is, why would God do those kinds of things? Because he's God. And he was the one what? He was avenging Israel. By the way, remember... The Old Testament is all about Israel, who is considered the son of God, his child, his beloved, all the acronyms you want to give to him, to Israel, and anybody did anything to them, God would crush them. Even when they're out there in the middle of nowhere, God still provided a prophet Ezekiel for them. God never left them. He always provided for them, always took care of them. But don't let anybody else fool you. Don't you touch them. Nobody, no one, because he'll destroy you. Same way with us. David understands we destroy. We destroy them. God has given us the victory. And finally, thou didst deliver me from the strivings of the people. Thou hast made me the head of the heathen. People whom I have not known shall serve me. The people that won't serve God, they're going to serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. Now, whether or not this is a reference to the Davidic throne. Oh, no, I, I, I'm just looking at the topic. I, never, I haven't read his yet, but I would assume. I read this before. Yeah, the millennial kingdom. Yeah, this is a reference to that Davidic kingdom. By the way, if, when I say millennial kingdom, millennial stands for a thousand year reign, okay? A thousand year reign. Satan is bound for a thousand years. And there's going to be a, a king that sits upon the throne of David. What happened was man was supposed to be dominant over the earth, to rule the earth, and it was sublet out by Adam himself. David's his son, his descendant, is going to sit upon the throne. Second Samuel chapter 7, God said, I will make a dynasty. I will make you a kingdom. And that kingdom will establish for a thousand years Jesus himself, wait a minute, well, God, the son of God's going to come down. He's the son of man, brothers and sisters. He'll be the man from Galilee, the man from Nazareth. And he will sit upon that throne for 1,000 years. And David understands this about that kingdom that will be set up. He says, they, the people that don't know me, they're going to serve me. And when they hear me, they'll do, the stranger shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth. 
and blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people unto me. Summarization, summar, summarize, summarizing all of it, bringing it to a close, tying up all the loose ends. God did the delivering. God fought the battle. David doesn't see the enemy that's against him. He sees the enemy against God. God, deliver me. I'm just doing your work, Lord. I've got you. I'll take care of you. It is God that avengeth me, subdueth people unto me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises in thy name. What will I do? I'm going to walk around and tell you how tough we are. We're bad people. God takes care of us. No, I'm not going to do that, Lord. I'm going to walk around and tell people how good you are. Not brag on myself. I'm going to brag on how good God is. I started so many churches. I got these people. You know, I started the church over here. You know, I've had so many souls son, saved under my ministry. No, there's something wrong with your salvation. You need to be talking about what God has done. When COVID came along, we used to do this, right? You used to have a little thing up there. You put it to how many people came, attendance and all that, keeping record. Really doesn't matter, does it? You know what really matters? Getting people saved. We need the number to people. <laughs> they all belong to God, don't they? Does it matter how many you got coming to church or does it matter who's saved? That thing always bothered me and I never understood it. When I got to, got to a Lumber River Bible Church, I began to study in that thing and I said, wait a minute, God, you know, are we right to be sending all these numbers into the Southern Baptist Convention? We're talking about the attendance. All the people that come to our church ain't saved on Sunday morning. Why are we counting all them? Well, that's many people come to your church. Does that make any sense, by the way? Does it make any sense to you sending? We got so many our attendance each Sunday. Some saved, some ain't. Has no purpose at all. What's more important is to get people saved. God knows those that are his. He said, I'll take care of them. I'll separate the sheep from the goats. I remember David's last sin. What was it? David's final sin. He numbered the people. The last sin David ever did. First, it was, a, was it first Kings uh, or last of first, second Samuel. He numbered the people. And God said, I'll give you three choices now. You can have this punishment, this punishment, or this punishment. And the one that fell where God would be on the mercy of God, I'll take that, Lord, because I know you're merciful. If you let my enemies be upon me, they'll, they'll, go, they'll overdo it, but I know how you are. You do it just right. <laughs> David understands God. He understood him. Great deliverance giveth he to the his king. He showeth mercy to his anointed to David and to his seed forevermore. David understood God. He was after God's heart. He understood how God worked. Paul, the Apostle, was it Paul that said this? That I might know him and the power of his resurrection, to know who God is, to understand how he want, what he wants. And God wants us to go out in the highways and edges and compel people to come. He don't want you to bring them to church so they can hear the preacher preach. Well, come be a part of our group. You don't need to be a part of a group. You need to be a part of Christ. And they need to hear it from people. We go out there in our, wherever we are. Whether you're meeting a guy at the local store, cutting somebody's hair, working amongst the public out there, them hot hands you got there, Brother Andre, and you're witnessing to them. I hear you call them boys out. And wherever we're at, we're trying to witness to them. Because we got the mind of God. What would God say? We want to get them saved. That's the most important thing. Um, we'll stop there. I won't pick up in verse chapter 2019. We only got through 18 tonight. Let's stop there and we'll pick up there next week. It's a long chapter because some of them are like 10, only about what, 10 verses, nine verses. So that was a long one. But guess what? That's because he was in such trouble. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. David, you said at the end of each chapter, he talked about the Which one? Where? Which verse? That one about the next one. What about the nation? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That don't know me, but they'll serve me. Yeah, reference to the millennial kingdom. That because all those nations are going to bow before him, every knee. They're all going to be 
in his under his realm. And guess what? Nobody would get out of line. Why? You know what happens when you get out of line with him? <laughs> Somebody asked me that. I said, wait, 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 wait. God's not that cruel. He killed a man just because he ate a piece of fruit. Now don't you ever get that wrong. He, he destroyed an entire nation for disobedience. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's the way God is, right? That's the way he is. And when he rules like that, guess what? Everybody's in line. You know how it was the first, Brother Andre, I'm, I'm sure your, your family was like mine. The first time you got you got old enough to learn it, boy, daddy would, boy, when they got your hope, never done it again. The last whipping I got about them chickens, don't you ever think I didn't feed them chickens? You make sure they was fed on time, too. It wasn't me after dark, but it'd be fed before it gets dark, you know? God. I understand we'll have a word of prayer and be dismissed. All right, Lord, we'll see you all tomorrow night. Thank you for your time.